Excellent. Good evening, everybody. As Helen said, my name is Jen Gupta. I'm an astronomer working in the Institute of Cosmology and Gravitation at the University of Portsmouth. Uh, you can sometimes also find me in the planetarium at the Winchester Science Center, or organizing the Winchester Science Festival, or generally just talking about astronomy to anyone who will listen, and some people who don't want to listen. But I keep going um, anyway. So I've always loved science. I've always loved observing the world around me, forcing my dog to um, participate as well. Um, but I've not always wanted to be an astronomer. At various times of my life, I wanted to be a doctor, I wanted to be a vet, I wanted to study volcanoes, I wanted to be a marine biologist. At some point, I thought I should maybe tone this all back and maybe just find a cure for cancer. Um, <laughs> and I've also always loved music, so this is nothing to do with me, but here's me playing the piano. Um, so at one point, I wanted to be part of the London Symphony Orchestra, but mostly so I could play on the Star Wars Episode Three soundtrack. Um, <laughs> And I also went through my rock star phase, but with a science twist again, that I wanted to be the first drummer in space. And I have to say that I will always love my physics teacher at school because she told me that I wasn't stupid for wanting to think that, and I could be a drummer um, and a physicist. But I ended up as an astronomer or an astrophysicist, and I partly chose astrophysics because it sounds cooler than straight physics. Um, but <laughs> that is genuinely, genuinely true when I was picking uh, my university choices. But I do think that um, astrophysics, this study of the universe, astronomy, astrophysics, cosmology, whatever you want to call it, it's fascinating, but it's also a bit tricky because we can never go to these distant objects, these stars, these galaxies, these nebulae. We can't go to them. We can land a rover on Mars. Um, but the majority of the things we study, uh, we can't go there, we can't run experiments, we can't go to a star and bring some bits back to test in the lab. Everything we know pretty much about this universe that we live in, we know because we observe the light um, coming from these objects, either emitted by these objects, reflected off these objects. So sometimes a lack of light also tells us what's going on. And we use huge telescopes to give us these gorgeous images. And to be honest, I could probably spend the next eight minutes just showing you more pictures and everyone would go home really happy. But I probably shouldn't do that. I want to talk to you um, about a technique that astronomers use to unlock the mysteries contained within this light um, that we observe. And then I want to actually tell you about uh, one of my new science heroes um, from the 19th century, an astronomer that I discovered um, while doing some research for this talk. So at this point, um, I'm going to ask our lovely um, volunteers if they could um, hand out some glasses for us. So what I want to talk to you about is a technique, as I said, that astronomers use, um, and it's a technique called spectroscopy. And spectroscopy is all to do um, with this. Um, we're not talking about an epic album by Pink Floyd, um, <laughs> but I do love the fact that I can put this in and talk about Pink Floyd for a second. No, we're talking about what happens when you shine a white light through a glass prism. Um, the white light gets bent, um, as it enters the glass, and then again when it leads, leaves, and you get this rainbow out at the other side. And that's because what we see as white light is actually made up of all the different colors of the rainbow. So as you're getting your glasses, you should be starting to see um, something a little bit like this, hopefully. Uh, we've got a lot of different lights around here. They're not all um, white, so you're probably seeing some different colors. The exit light looked really cool um, when we looked at that earlier. You all look awesome right now, so I'm actually gonna take a photo of this. Uh, I didn't appreciate quite how cool this would look. Uh, everyone wave. Brilliant, so if everyone's got their glasses on now, if we could have um, the house lights down, please, because not all lights, not all lights give you all the different colors of the rainbow. So if I switch this lamp on, um, have a look at this lamp on the stage, but have a look around it, sort of where I am. You should see, instead of a continuous rainbow, you should now be seeing a few different bright lines of color, hopefully might turn the projector off for a sec. Is everyone seeing that? Hopefully over on the sides. Brilliant. 
what you should be seeing is this pattern. So you should see a really bright red and a really bright turquoise, a really bright purple. Hoping or the murmuring means that you're all seeing that. Brilliant, great. If we could have the um, lights back on. And we'll switch this off because it makes a really annoying humming noise. Um, cool, so this lamp um, contains a gas. So there's a gas inside this tube there. And it's um, a gas called hydrogen. It's the first chemical element in the periodic table, the most abundant element that you get out in the universe. And when we put a current through it in this lamp, we basically excite these atoms and make them glow. But the atoms can't emit every color of the rainbow. They can only emit certain colors, which is why we get this pattern here that's called the spectrum um, of this element. And every element in the periodic table has its own unique spectrum. Here's some of them. And so the spectrum of a gas is a little bit like its fingerprint. It's unique to that element. And so you can identify the um, element that you're looking at just by looking at the spectrum. And you can all keep those glasses, but please don't look directly at the sun with them because you will go blind. But apart from that, take them home, look at different lights, um, and investigate what's going on. So this is a technique, um, as I think I said, called spectroscopy. And it's a tool that astronomers have used since the mid-19th century to understand more um, about the universe. And the use of spectroscopy by these 19th century astronomers to identify chemicals in the um, sun and in stars, the different elements than the objects that they were observing, this has been heralded really as the birth of astrophysics, uh, bringing together those techniques used to study physics here on Earth with observations um, of the cosmos. And one of the pioneers of this subject of spectroscopy was this lady, um, Lady Margaret Huggins, who, as with so many historic uh, astronomers, has really been relegated in the history books to a mere assistant to a prominent male astronomer. And in Margaret's case, that was her husband, William. Now, don't get me wrong, William was a fantastic scientist. Uh, he was an amateur astronomer. He devoted his life um, to furthering our understanding of the cosmos. But Margaret was much, much more than merely his assistant. She was an extraordinary scientist in her own right. But you probably won't have heard of her. I certainly hadn't heard of her until I started looking into the subject for this talk, looking into the history of spectroscopy to see if I could find someone that I could talk about at this event. But the more that I find out about Margaret, the more that I really admire her. And it's not just because their house was basically an observatory, which sounds awesome. And they had two dogs that they named after astronomers, which is, you know, kind of my life dream. Um, that makes it sound a little bit flippant, but I do think that those two um, stories about them do sort of highlight the passion that they had for astronomy. So Margaret was born in Dublin in 1848. Uh, she was homeschooled, and then she went to a finishing school in Brighton. Um, by all accounts, she developed a love for astronomy at a very early age. She would read books and magazines around the subject. She would observe the sky through a small telescope. And then in 1875, she married um, William. And one of my favorite stories about her life is that when they got married, one of her friends gave her a spectroscope as a wedding present, which certainly beats the towels and the plates and the unauthorized biography of Brian Cox that I got. <laughs> it was signed, which I think is quite funny. My friend actually went and got Brian Cox to sign an unofficial biography. Um, but Margaret moved into William's house in London with their observatory, and they devoted their lives to astronomy. Now, around the time that they got married, dry photographic plates were being developed, and this allowed them to actually take photographs of spectra. So they could take photographs of the spectra of different objects out there in space, compare them to the spectrum that they observe in the lab using lamps like these, and then identify the lines, figure out which elements are in these objects, and work out what's going on with those lines that they couldn't identify with ones um, on the ground. But for the first 15 years of their marriage, all of this research, all of their observations were only published under William's name. It wasn't until 1889 that the first publication appeared um, with Margaret's name, although interestingly, she's always listed as Mrs. Huggins rather than getting her full name in it. After that, they um, started publishing more as a joint um, couple, but 
Looking at the observatory notes, it seems that Margaret was contributing to their science in a major way a long time before that. She would do experiments with their setup and she would make notes where she'd get frustrated that William wouldn't heed her advice because it seems that she actually knew quite a bit more about photography than she did. William would not take my counsel and I regret much. They worked together for 35 years and one of the key pieces of work they put together was this, an atlas of representative stellar spectra. And I actually went to the Royal Astronomical Society this afternoon and had a look at their copy of this. It's a fantastic piece of work, a reference of the spectra of different stars for astronomers around the world to use. William, as you can imagine, reaped the benefits of these discoveries. He was the president of the Royal Society. He was knighted. But Margaret very much was on the sidelines. She was made an honorary member of the Royal Astronomical Society, I believe the fourth woman to do so. But as I said, like many women back in history, she was relegated to mostly an assistant. And you might think that that's just a sign of the times, that's just what happened in those days, but it seems that Margaret actually helped this myth along. She had these romantic notions that a woman's place was sort of behind her husband to support him, to um, promote him, to dedicate her life to his advancement. And nearly everything that we know about this couple um, comes from Margaret's um, writings about them. But there's um, a researcher who's studied um, their lives called Barbara Becker, and she's looked at the... Um, correspondence between Margaret and William. She's looked at their notes from the observatory. And she comes up with a rather different view than this idea of the able assistant. She says that Margaret's very presence and expertise not only strengthened, but also shaped the research agenda of their observatory. So I'd like to slightly rewrite the history on this wonderful lady. The work that William and Margaret did has, as I said, paved the way for modern astrophysics. In the early 20th century, building on their work, um, Annie Jump Cannon took the spectra of thousands of stars, coming up with a way to classify them based on their spectrum. This work was then taken on by Cecilia Payne, who came up with an explanation of the different spectral classes based on how much hydrogen and helium were in those stars. Looking at the spectra of stars and gas in galaxies, looking at the way that it moves around the galaxy, allowed Vera Rubin to come up with some of the first evidence of dark matter out there in the universe. And today, astronomers use spectra for all sorts of things, working out that there are planets going around other stars. And using huge survey telescopes to take the spectra of hundreds of thousands of stars and galaxies out there in the universe. I would argue that spectroscopy is probably the most powerful tool that an astronomer has to study the universe, thanks in no small part to this wonderful lady, Margaret Huggins. And I will finish there. Thank you very much, and enjoy the rest of your night.